So the last group of protists that we'll talk about is the informal group algae. And as a reminder, algae is just referring to the plant-like protists. So all the protists that we're about to talk about are photosynthesizers. Now this picture is showing a green algae, but algae can actually be a lot of different colors. So let's go ahead and start exploring them. The first algae um, protist group that we'll talk about is group diatoms. Diatoms are literally beautiful. And the reason they're beautiful is they kind of have this shell around them that is silica based. And silica is what we use to make glass. And they kind of give off this glass like appearance like you see in these two pictures. Now these are considered phytoplankton. So phyto, I've mentioned briefly before that phyto or phyta means plant like. Plankton, while we're not going to talk about plankton that much um, in depth, plankton is a term used for aquatic organisms that can't move against the current. So these are things that are so small and so light that the current of the lake, of the pond, of the river, of the ocean that they're in is what actually drives their movement. They really don't have the ability to move in a direction against the current. This doesn't mean they can't move at all. It just means that if the water's going this way, they literally don't have the strength to go that way. So phytoplankton just means, hey, they're really light organisms that are found in the water. And that can do photosynthesis. Not only are they phytoplankton, they are the most common phytoplankton in the world. And despite them being unicellular, they actually form a, a really incredible service for us as humans because they serve as a carbon pump. Now, as I mentioned before, they have a silica shell. There's some other molecules in it, but mostly silica. And inside of the shell is the organism. The organism, like all other organisms on Earth, are carbon-based. You're carbon-based, your dog's carbon-based, your neighbor's carbon-based, like every, all living things are carbon-based. Now what happens is that these guys are doing photosynthesis. They're bringing in carbon dioxide. They're taking in sunlight. They're taking in water. And then that solar energy is going to essentially recombine that carbon dioxide in water to create the organic carbon, um, carbon molecule glucose as well as other molecules. But here's the thing. If these diatoms die of natural causes, so I'm, they're not being eaten by something else, they just die. They sink to the bottom of that ocean floor, lake floor, wherever they're living. And the thing is, is that carbon that was inside of that diatom is, is stuck. That silica shell, just like other types of shells, take a really long time to naturally break down. Yes, they're incredibly small, but they're still incredibly strong. And natural processes to break down those silica shells, we're talking hundreds and thousands of years. So the carbon organism that's inside of it doesn't decompose. Decomposers literally cannot get to that organism. So all of that carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus and all the other stuff that's inside that diatom is stuck. And we call this a carbon pump. And the, the pump is the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is being taken in by these diatoms. These diatoms die and then they sink to the bottom and they've essentially moved carbon from our atmosphere to the, to the ocean floor or lake floor. So this is what we mean by pump. It's literally moving that carbon from the atmosphere to the ocean floor. Now I said this is good for humans. And the reason it's good for humans is because we suck at pollution. Or actually, I guess you could say we're great at pollution. We're really good at it. So humans are currently emitting a lot of carbon dioxide. We do this because we're burning not just fossil fuels, but fuels in general are going to release carbon dioxide. We're getting more in our atmosphere. This is going to contribute to climate change because carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. And then we now have this accumulation of carbon dioxide. Well, one of our goals can be to extract it, take it out of the atmosphere. And diatoms are actually doing this for us. Not on a super wide scale, this is not gonna fix the problem with humans, but they're helping because they're able to take that carbon dioxide and essentially transfer it to the ocean floor uh, and it's no longer affecting uh, our atmosphere. So really important tool, and scientists are trying to figure out if there's a way that we can cause faster growth of diatoms so that we can take advantage of the service that they do acting as a carbon pump. 
The next group of algae we'll talk about is one that you might be more familiar with, is the group brown algae. And as the name suggests, <laughs> it is brown. Um, and one of the species of brown algae you might be familiar with is kelp. Some people also just call it seaweed. For most, for the most part, most seaweeds are brown algae. They're not all. If you say kelp, you're golden. If you say seaweed, I'll, I'll probably still accept it. But seaweed refers to a lot of different things. And so brown algae is actually really cool because they form forests underwater. And these forests are great for hiding not just of the seal that you see, but um, fishes. So a lot of different fish species will reproduce in kelp forests because it's providing cover for their offspring. A lot of organisms rely on kelp forest for breeding, for eating, uh, for uh, social things. It's important for a lot of different things. And so these kelp forests are incredibly important. And like I said, you might see some of this wash up on the beach. Now you'll notice in this picture that one, this algae is upright, but I'm gonna tell you right now, it, it's not solid. I mean, you've, you've seen seaweed on the beach. It's like limp, right? So it's kind of cool that these are upright. There's actually two things helping it. One thing is called a nematocyst and the other thing is called a holdfast. Now, I'm not going to really explain those here because there's a video that you see currently listed on this slide. There's a video that actually does underwater photography of a kelp forest, and it's actually going to explain the function of both of those structures in kelp. Now, when this video comes up, be sure to only watch between three to four minutes like the, the actual time step, like three minutes into the video and then watch it for a minute until you hit the four minute mark. You are more than welcome if you're interested to watch more of it, but that minute is going to focus on the kelp forest and the nematocyst and hold fast. Make sure as you're watching this video that you are taking notes on what those two structures are. And I would encourage you potentially even uh, make a small sketch in your notes as to what those structures look like, and that might help you remember their functions. So go ahead and pause here, click on the link that is coming up on this uh, video, go watch that, and then come back here. So hopefully you got yourself good definitions of nematocysts, and you can actually see them in this picture. This kelp that's closest to the camera has a lot of those air bladders helping it stay upright, and you got a better look at what those holdfasts are. Again, to be clear, holdfasts, hold fast, although they're root-like, they are not roots. And this is important because roots are found exclusively in plants. Roots absorb nutrients. Roots absorb water. The only function of the holdfast is, is to hold on fast, um, is to hold, is to anchor. While roots do help that with plants, uh, again, roots are going to also do nutrient absorption, which holdfasts do not do. The next group of algae we'll talk about is group chlorophytes. So that phyte, again, referring to plant-like. And then chloro is actually referring to um, chloroplast, chlorophyll. So these are green. Um, chloroplast and chlorophyll are, are really the chlorophyll uh, is referring to that green color. So this is green algae. We had brown algae. There's also, although we won't cover it, there's also things like red algae and golden algae. And the names are based on the pigments being used. In green algae, they're using the pigments chlorophyll. Now, the reason I bring up these guys is because specifically, I wanted to introduce this organism, Volvox. Again, this is the genus name. They're are other species or lots of different species of Volvox, but these are super common in our area um, in our freshwater systems. And so what's cool about Volvox, now remember, algae can be multicellular. And what these guys do is they form colonies. So we're going to look at one circle. One of these large circles is a colony of Volvox. We would call that whole thing Volvox. But in reality, Volvox is made up of lots of individual cells. So each of these small little dots you see are cells. They're flagellated cells. Similar to group Dinoflagelletta, these flagellated cells have two flagella. There's about 10,000 of them that make up a 3D sphere. And these 10,000 
uh, flagellated cells work together and move their flagella, small flagella, but flagella nonetheless, move their flagella in order to move that entire colony in a direction, which is pretty cool. So made up of lots and lots of cells. Now you may notice inside of this sphere, we have larger, much larger in comparison. These are reproductive cells. These are the cells that are gonna create more of the flagellated transportation cells. They'll create more of the reproductive cells. They're gonna create more Volvox colonies. One of the things I just like about Volvox, it's just pretty. I mean, diatoms are pretty too, but honestly, I think Volvox is prettier, uh, mainly because diatoms, when you look at them under an actual microscope, they look just more clear unless you add a dye to it. But Volvox, I mean, this is what it looks like under a microscope. Uh, so kind of really pretty protists. So again, the, the protist, the whole globe or the whole sphere is Volvox, but then the small ones are the flagellated movement cells and the large ones are the reproductive cells. And these cells are all kind of independent but also work together in, in a colony, uh, which is kind of cool. Now, the video that I have for you guys is just looking a close-up at Volvox. You'll be able to see those transport cells and actually their flagella moving back and forth. You can see it a lot easier versus like looking at this still photo. So there's not much in there. It's just giving you an idea of what I mean by these flagellated cells. And I'll kind of zoom into different parts of Volvox. So go ahead and pause here and then go ahead and go watch that video just to kind of see Volvox in action. All right, last but not least, we have group Carophyta. This is a common one that gets mixed up, understandably because its name is very close to Chlorophyta. So honestly, you just have to straight memorize this. There's really no tips or tricks that I have for you. Group Carophyta is also a green algae. They have chloroplasts that are using the chlorophyll pigment, so they do come off as green. The organism found in here it, we just call them just uh, the major term are stone warts and stone warts are kind I mean they kind of look like plants I mean if you look at this picture down here if you didn't know better you'd be like ah a plant <laughs> and it is a plant found in water um, but it's actually not a plant and again it's not a plant because it lacks vascularization it doesn't have the tubes and stuff that move and transport water and nutrients throughout the organism whereas plants do have that so despite the fact that they look a lot like plants they're not plants but what is cool is that we are scientists are pretty sure that land plants is what I guess, branched off from the carophytes. So I have a kind of simplified phylogenetic tree over here. We have ancestral algae, or alga, the singular, and this is diverging into red algae, and then diverging into the chlorophytes, like Volvox, and then diverging into the carophytes and the land plants. And so we think they have a very similar or very shared lineage with land plants, and so they share a lot of similar characteristics. They're not the same, but share a lot of common characteristics. So it's kind of cool. Um, it looks like a land plant because it shared a pretty recent ancestor with the land plants, but these guys found in the water and lack that vascularization. So again, there are more types of algae. You saw on that phylogenetic tree, there was a red algae. There, uh, there's so many to talk about, but again, a lot of those, either you are familiar like kelp or um, these are things um, that you can find in our freshwater ecosystems. So these are all plant-like. They are doing photosynthesis. Don't forget, again, our dinoflagellates also do photosynthesis. We don't really refer to them as algae, though, uh, or you can, but they're also a protozoan. So just don't forget about them. They, they do both, but I just had it um, earlier on. These guys, incredibly important, found in um, ecosystems around the world, are very important photosynthesizers. Actually, algae are just as important as photosynthesizers as our land plants, which should make sense to you because Earth is more covered in water than land. Uh, so there's a lot more algae in comparison also doing this photosynthesis. So don't be like, ah, they're not vascular. They're not plants, they're not important. They're incredibly important, particularly to our aquatic food chains.